The Hayes Effect with Kathleen Hayes and Bonnie Quinn. David Edwards, as I said, president at Heron Financial Group. David, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy 2014. What an amazing year 2013 was. Wasn't it, though? And, you know, we had a report on with Phil Clint's Bloomberg News this morning just saying how everybody, for the most part, so badly underestimated what stocks would do in 2013. And now uh, the, the this, this juncture. What do you see for investors I, and for I, stocks at the beginning of I this year? I sat here this time a year ago and said that my forecast for the year was 8% in the S&P. And it came in at 32%. So one of us is wrong. And uh, I, I, if I look at the, uh, the overall situation, I think the markets actually got a little bit ahead of themselves. Sure, a lot of good things went right in, in uh, 2013 that wasn't expected. But now we have to think about 2014. You said 8%. We actually got a 32% increase. So those people that were calling for just 8%, what, what did you get wrong, basically? So the expectation was that quantitative easing would end sooner rather than later. And in the end, because of the sequester, which wasn't really planned for, and the government shut down, the Fed elected to keep the, the sequester going a bit longer, up through 2014. So that was the main difference. But then the other thing that happened was what I call a sea change in investor attitudes. So from 2019, I'm sorry, uh, 2009 through 2012, American investors were net sellers of stock funds and net buyers of bond funds. In other words, they were selling low and buying high. Over the last five years, the return in the S&P, 130%. Over the last five years, the return in bonds, 5%. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, in 2013, investors said, hey, I'm not, I'm not participating in this monster rally. Let me get my, myself into that market. And so from October 1st on, the market rallied another 10% just based on fund flows. So the sea change of investor sentiment, but you're a little bit concerned about the timing of the sea change, David? Absolutely. We, we know, statistically speaking, that 98% of investors get it wrong. They buy when they should sell, they sell when they should buy. So, you know, I see it in my own clients. A client emailed me this morning and said, Dave, I want to sell all my bonds to put 100% in stocks. And I have to talk them down from that. Because my forecast is that we'll have a positive year for stocks in 2014, but we will see a 10% correction along the way. So people should wait to get into stocks? Well, no. It, you, should be, you should do proper asset allocation. If this is money you need for, for the next five years to fund your retirement or your kids' college, uh, experience, uh, education, then you can comfortably put money in stocks because we know we're going to get on average 8 or 10% returns, even if we have a 10% or a 20% correction along the way. If there's money you need this year or this month or this quarter for a house closing or tax payment, you can't have it in stocks. It's got to be in cash. You know, maybe it's not exactly the right time to be getting in stocks if there's a correction coming, but we should still stick with sort of reasonable asset allocations. What is that? Is that 60-40? Well, no, it, it varies. Could be 100% for a 20-year-old. 100% stocks. It could be 60-40 for an 80-year-old who's living on, on their portfolio for retirement. Uh, we work with 90 families, 90 separate asset allocations, depending on the needs of the situation. Uh, what we've been doing pretty aggressively in December and January is taking profits on our U.S. Uh, stocks, which uh, really had, have had the most phenomenal returns over the last five years, even better than the emerging markets, even better than the European markets, and rolling that money selectively into the markets that haven't done so well. So we're upping our allocation to European and Australian stocks. We're upping our allocation to, to emerging markets. We're upping our allocation to commodities, which had a very poor year in 2013. And we're also buying bonds selectively. What kind of bonds? How so, selective do you have to be? So we're pretty confident that the 10-year Treasury is going to be at 4.5% by the end of 2015. It's going to be, it's 3% now, 3.5% by the end of this year, marching ever steadily higher. Why do we pick 4.5%? Because that's where the market was in uh, 2007, right before everything went to hell. Mm -hmm. And um, so we know it's got to get there eventually. So what we're doing is we're focusing on short maturity bonds Mm -hmm. of three to five years, and we're going down in credit quality. So we're buying corporate bonds, we're buying junk bonds, we're buying preferred stock. Uh, these all have yields in the four to six percent range that will that will cover us uh, somewhat for uh, uh, principal loss uh, while rates go higher, mm-hmm. and then we'll have capital available to deploy it at longer maturities when the time is right. So, for example, this year the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index was down two percent, and uh, the funds that we prefer were up about uh, up about two percent. Huh. So you still can hang in there and and uh, make some money. So so we're going to uh, be wary of stocks. Unless you're in Europe, Asia, previously kind of beaten up, lagging the U.S., you would say, right? Across our entire firm, we're 65% in U.S. stocks, 15% international stocks, and 25% in bonds. Okay. Give us some of your scenarios. What's your best case scenario? So a lot of our work revolves around setting expectations and managing clients' um, behavior and, and fears and concerns. And 
the back in 2009, March 2009, a pretty miserable uh, six months for us. Uh, six clients fired me right at the pit of the market. They took their money and left and went to cash. And that was a magic bell ringing to go 100% invested with everybody else who stayed at the firm. Um, now we've four years have gone by, five years have gone by. Investors are feeling a lot more confident. They're less worried about the money they could lose and more worried about the money that they're not making. And what they want to do is own the best performing sectors because clients, uh, investors in general, want to buy high and sell low. So we need to, to temper that enthusiasm and say, sure, it's a good idea to have uh, stocks in your portfolio for the long run, but let's talk about some things that could go wrong over the next year that might make you less enthusiastic. And so uh, I happened to be at a, at a technology show for investment advisors, and there was a terrific product uh, uh, put out by a couple of guys from Deutsche Bank and Bank of America. It's called Hidden Levers, and it enables us to take a client's portfolio or our entire portfolio across all of our clients and do some stress testing. So the, their model is basically doing correlations between different asset classes and then looking back in history. Uh, so I brought a couple of examples that we can, we so can talk about. So explain this. Stress testing for what exactly? Stress okay. testing for a so more I'll, negative growth environment? I'll give an example. Right now, commodities are kind of on the low side. And that reflects the fact that the world economy is in second gear right now, and demand from China and India and Brazil is on the low side. Well, what happens if, if demand starts picking up as we get into 2014? Um, commodities are very uh, react very quickly at the margin. So you go from 80 bucks a barrel in oil to 100 to 120 pretty quickly. I think we're at 100 right now, 99, something like that. Um, so what if commodity prices jump 10%? What would that do to our portfolios all over? And we can use this tool, Hidden Levers, to, to, to see what happens. And so, for example, what we see is, okay, inflation would pick up because commodities have been inflation. Uh, yields would pick up re reacting to inflation. Um, but surprisingly, uh, S&P 500 would also do well because... Um, the driver of the stock market is not inflation, it's corporate earnings, mm. it's corporate revenues, it's corporate cash on the balance sheets. And rising commodity prices implies rising growth, which implies rising earnings, which implies rising stocks. So we can show this to a client and say, okay, well, we're not going to go whole hog for gold, but if... But rising inflation, as you mentioned, would erode some of that, though. Um, but, but, but this model shows us that the, that the negative of rising inflation, rising yields would be offset by faster economic growth. Mm -hmm. And so we can say, well, that's a scenario that we'd be happy to see. Uh, I actually use the price of oil as kind of a, a tachometer on the entire economy. 80 means we're going into recession. 120 means we're going to have some tightening. Mm -hmm. 100 where we are right now means we're, we're doing fine. So you said that uh, investors are pushing you for the best parts of the economy, best parts of the market. Where do you see those at the moment? So after this monster rally in, uh, in U.S. stocks, we're forecasting that sometime next year, the U.S. stock market will fall 10%. We don't know why. Is it terrorism? Is it uh, a bad uh, jobs report? Is it uh, the Fed becoming more aggressive on quantitative, on ending quantitative easing? We don't know. But we do know that when you have a rally this far and this fast and this strong, there's going to be a correction. So uh, we have, starting in December 1st and, and running through the end of the month, been, been aggressively selling U.S. stocks and buying the sectors that did not perform well last year. Uh, European markets performed okay, emerging markets did poorly, commodities did very poorly, and bonds did poorly. We are reallocating to the underperforming sectors and buying low. Tell me a little, I want to come back quickly, though, to your Hidden Levers is the company that you're using their proprietary technology mm -hmm. for your customers. Right. You've developed an app as well. Yeah, so we were so impressed by this technology. Uh, and, you know, any, any, uh, any model is only as good as, as, as past history. So we don't, we don't focus on, you know, the third decimal place of the calculations, but we do focus on direction and magnitude. So if we see that uh, an increase in, in commodity prices might be a 10% gain in the overall stock market, well, okay, magnitude and direction. If we see that uh, quantitative, uh, the end of quantitative easing pushes the, the economy back into recession, well, the direction would be negative and the magnitude might be down 20%. So do you plug in your assumptions into the model to make to, to get the, 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 the kind of the stress measurers? So the modelers are very talented people, and they have 40 or 50 scenarios um, that we can address on an ongoing basis. And the, the technology is so impressive that we actually work with them uh, to make a miniature version of it available right on the Heron Financial Group website. But I have to be your customer to do that? Nope. Uh, you go to the homepage, heronfinancialgroup.com, and you, you go to the lower right screen, and there's a little button that says Hidden Levers. And any investor in the whole country can go in and enter their portfolio, uh, symbol and, and quantity, 
Or if they have a complex portfolio, they can email it to us and we'll, we'll model it for them. Wow, that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. But I just quickly an example though. You said it, with the end of QE, quantitative easing, push the U.S. economy into recession. Does do they does hidden levers do the mo, do, the the research that says whether or not that would happen, or do you pick out your dis, your conclusion and and plug that in to the app? The, they've done the research, and we just work with the outputs. Hmm. Okay, so so for that quantitative easing example. Um, the the question is, what if the Fed is, uh, does away with quantitative easing too quickly uh-huh. and the economy is forced back into recession? Well, what's happened in past recessions that were driven by the Fed? Okay, well, now we can see that yields come down rapidly, inflation comes down rapidly, the dollar rallies, and stocks fall. All right, well, now we can take that into a meeting with the client and do some, what if this happens? What if that happens? Hey, your worst case scenario is down 20%. I see. Could you live with that exactly. for assets we don't need Because we could say years? that probably won't happen, but what if it did? Exactly. You're just trying to create these parameters exactly. for people. If you knew that your best case scenario for 2014 was plus 10% and minus, and minus 20% on the downside, you could probably sleep at night. It's the uncertainty that drives people crazy. All right. And really quickly, tech next year, particularly 3D printing, you're saying? We have done a lot of research in the last six months into the 3D printer space. Once upon a time, there was a Commodore computer. It was a hobbyist computer, 40 characters per screen. You hooked it up to your TV. That's where the 3D printer space was for the last several years. At this point, we now see those machines moving out of a hobbyist garage and into industrial plants uh, to do rapid prototyping. And so, for example, I'm sitting in a chair right now with plastic uh, shoulders. Uh, You could model that in-house rather than shipping it off to a modeler. So, David Edwards, thank you so very much for joining us. 